Hi, Misha here. And let's talk about a ship from everyone's favorite film, Episode 8, The Last Jedi. This is a so-called Resistance Bomber. But its official name is the MG-100 SF-17, or B SF-17. Star Fortress. This is a long range heavy star bomber. And it was designed, initially produced by Slane and Corporal, a company famous for some other craft, including the V 19 Torrent from the Clone Wars, which was a fighter. Although it did have missile launchers, not common for that day. And more so, the B-Wing, which was an attack or an assault bomber or light bomber. And I just brought these out because even though one was designed in the early 80s, one in the 2000s, and one in the 2017 time period... By different people I actually do kind of see the resemblance a bit I also think this resembles the uh, Nebulon B frigate think about it you have this hanging end down here sticking out you have this wide part up here and then it gets skinny and then kind of flares out a bit in the back I just picked this up and so this is the first time I have seen this ship, and so my reaction is interesting. It's, I will say this for sure. This is not what I thought it looked like. Anywho, you look at the front, you'll see why originally this would be known as the T-Wing. Though this name would never carry over officially into the show. I think it should have. It looks like a T. More so than the B wing. It looks like a B to be fair. Actually the B wing looks more like a T wing too. <laughs> we don't have a ton of in universe specs for this. Partially because it's relatively new. Partially because we don't have both legends and modern Disney canon to go off of. We just have the modern canon. But what we do know. It's uh, just under 30 feet long, and I screwed that up, I apologize. It's just under 30 meters long, so yeah, quite big. And it's about 21 and a half meters tall. And it's about 15 and a half meters wide. So this is a big craft. I don't know its maximum speed in an atmosphere. We do know that it has six sublight engines. We don't know which class of hyperdrive it has, but it's pretty safe to say it's a class one or, or greater. We know that it has shielding. And we know that it has electronic countermeasures and systems to kind of jam enemy craft from targeting it and that's because while we don't know a top speed we do know that in universe it is said to be rather slow and unmaneuverable unmaneuverable uh, by I'm not sure about slow seems like it should be okay in a straight line but I digress also for defense we have six medium lasers that are remotely operated, including on each wing tip here. There's also one under the cockpit. And then we have three dual heavier lasers and turrets. We have two here and one down here. These are ball turrets. These are manned. 
We have a crew of five. We have the pilot up here. We have the co-pilot slash bombardier. And we have the flight engineer. Those make up those are the three members of the main crew. On top of that, we have two gunners. One on the bottom down here. And one in the back. And this is relatively well defended in the rear and in the bottom. But pretty lightly defended in the front as we really only have this one laser here. And the top only has one here, and then I guess these could rotate. But yeah, top-wise, it's kind of undefended. And it has a good bit of internal volume. But the whole point of this being a bomber is this giant bay here. It uses modular racks, magazines, or as they call them, clips, although that kind of bugs me. And it can carry over a thousand proton bombs, the same types of bombs that could go on the B-Wing or the Y-Wing. Or it could carry fewer, larger bombs. Or probably <laughs> like 10,000 thermal detonators. It's a, it's a very large bay. And that's kind of the point of this. The B-Wing had a good armament. But it wasn't going to take down the Star Destroyer in one go. And that's what the Rebels at the time, now the New Republic, needed. Something that could help them mop up the remaining Imperial Star Destroyers. And so the Star Fortress here was uh, created so it could basically one-shot large Imperial capital ships. And it had enough lasers, a total of 12, to defend itself. And would always be sent in with the fighter escort of uh, X-Wings or what have you. This was first kind of tested out after the battle at Endor. And was put into production around the time or maybe shortly after the battle of Jakku in 5 ABY. And these are put into rather large scale mass production during the last couple of years of the Civil War, during more of the mopping up campaign. However, the production run was relatively brief, because with the Galactic Disarmament Treaties, first they would take these out of production, and then later on many would be sold off or scrapped. So not many remained in the New Republic fleet by, say, 10 ABY. Which is how the Resistance ended up with some old ones when it was first found at around 28 ABY. But even it only had two squadrons of these, so not a huge number. Very specialized craft. But it was also quite versatile. Now the whole point of this is, you've already guessed, it was... Um, homage to the B-17 and that's perfectly okay in the Star Wars universe because the X-Wing, the TIE Fighter, the Y-Wing, all of those are homages to World War II fighter aircraft themselves. And I, I really do think it fits in. Uh, this cockpit is very much styled after that on a Corellian freighter like the Millennium Falcon. Which is funny because the Falcon's cockpit, cockpit, excuse me, was originally kind of inspired by the Boeing B-29, which was one of the successors to Boeing's B-17. The ball turrets are also reminiscent of it. Now you might say, well, ball turrets in a space battle, uh, that's that's not going to work, that, that's outdated. Or the idea that the bomb bay opens up to space, and that's... But here's the thing, all combat in Star Wars is hopelessly obsolete like an x-wing versus tie fighter dogfight that wouldn't be realistic in 2021 with our current jets heck even the speed of star wars craft would be slow by modern standards these are essentially all of them world war ii planes in space 
So you have to just kind of accept that. And I know some complained about the bomb bay being open to space. And the whole force field thing. You know what though? Star Trek's been doing that with Star Trek's shuttle bays forever. And no one's complained. So I'm okay with that. Now the bomb's just falling out. And kind of the retcon of uh, magnetic propulsion for them. Or magnetic guidance to their target. Yeah, that I'll give you. That, that's kind of bullshit. The, the, the bomb shouldn't have been... So obviously gra gravity bombs, they should have had propulsion visible on them, you know, rocket streaks or, you know, glowy, glowy bits. Something to show that they were, you know, doing it themselves. But anyway, I will also say the way these bombers, like, were paper tight, I mean, just, you know, blowing up just because they got sneezed on was ridiculous. In reality, the B-17 was a tough aircraft, as were bombers of that day. It is remarkable what many World War II bombers survived. So if they wanted to give a good homage to the B-17 with this, great. But make it as tough as the B-17. To me, it's very clear that Ron Johnson does not know military. And that's okay. Not everyone has to. I'm just pointing out the fact. Anyway, as I was saying, many of these were given to like planetary defense forces or even civilian organizations. They could be retrofit to be, say, firefighting, you know, dropping uh, fire retardant things because this bay was modular. It didn't just have to hold bombs. In fact, some areas use these as rapid resupply, especially for emergency or rescue situations, you know, drop medical supplies, food even oxygen canisters, until better help can get there, and it could carry a large amount. Mining corporations would load these up with charges to break apart ice, rock, what have you, to get at the juicy, juicy, whatever was underneath there. And many of these were used for scientific or scouting, charting, exploration missions because it was a long-range craft. It has quite a bit of internal space for the crew. can easily support five more if you retrofit it. One would hope it has a refresher inside. I guess you could just open the bomb bay and just shut out the bomb bay into space, right? And of course, this whole thing would allow you to carry lots of either extra stores for a longer range mission or scientific equipment, you know, probes or whatnot. That's another thing. Some of these were fitted with hundreds of uh, probe droids. So they could kind of launch them to detect the remaining Imperial remnants. So it was actually a versatile craft. I think it has a lot of potential in the Star Wars universe, and I really like the look. Now, full disclosure, I've always been partial to the Nebulon B frigate. So when I realized it was kind of a Nebulon B frigate in small form, I was all about it. I just think in that one film, it had the reverse of plot armor. But in reality, it should be slow lumbering, but it should be tough. And again, I, I do think it fits right in with... Sign in Corporal's other craft. If you look at the uh, the B wing here, wow, yeah. I was also going to mention that it does. It's very unbalanced on its stand. Anyway, here's our B wing. You can see just kind of how skeletal it is and everything. In fact, the B wing is about sixteen and a half meters tall. So, it's smaller, but not by a huge amount. I don't know. It just seems like there is a, certainly a uh, a design lineage here. And since the company was already partial to bombers. Yeah. I like it. It'd be kind of neat if the turrets moved, but it's a very heavy model. That's why it kind of falls. This whole thing is metal. The very tip here is plastic for the ball. The wings are, of course, 
plastic, I think, and the tail here with all the guns, plastic, with the centerpiece, and the Bombay piece, all metal, and since people just love The Last Jedi so much, you can find these everywhere for just a few dollars, brand new. This is from Hot Wheels, by the way. They're not really doing much in the Black Series titanium anymore, unfortunately. But I think Hot Wheels did a good job with this one. So, even though the film is the, I actually like this ship, it shows imagination, whereas Episode 7 and Episode 9, not so much. At least, I'm talking about when it comes to the ships. At least Episode 7 had some kind of neat designs like the TIE silencer and this here. So what do you think? Do you think it fits in? Would you like to see more of the um, MG100 SF-17? By the way, the name of the uh, laser turrets is the 1919, which of course is uh, an homage to the Browning. So this really was a, a dedication to the B-17. By the way, my uh, uh, step... What'd he be? I don't know. My stepmother's father. Step-grandfather? I don't know. He was uh, a crew member on a uh, B-17 in World War II. And he lived to a ripe old age and told stories about it. Braver man than I would be to get into one of those damn ball turrets, I tell you. <laughs> so yeah, with that, I thought it was just kind of neat. What do you think? As always, if you could, like, share, and subscribe. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.